Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to discuss lambda expressions. Lambdas in C++. Before we talk about lambdas and how they have changed since their introduction in C++11, we want to start with a discussion about function pointers and functors. A function pointer is actually a data type whose value points to a particular function. This pointer does not point to data, which is the normal usage of a pointer. In order to declare a function pointer, you have to specify the signature the function pointer will point to. A function pointer may only point to a function which has a matching signature. Unlike a normal pointer, a function pointer is never dereferenced. There is actually no dereference operator for it. You simply use the name of the function pointer as if it were a function. The most common place that function pointers are used is as an argument passed to another function, which will in turn invoke your callback. Here is a short example to show the syntax to declare, initialize, and use a function pointer. The pointer is named myProcess and can point to any function which has a single parameter of type int and a return type of void. The parameter list and the return type, this is what comprises the signature. My process is then initialized to point to std colon colon exit. This is a function, which is actually located in the standard library. std exit simply terminates your program when it is called. When we call my process, on the last line of this short program, we are going to exit with an error code of 42. A functor is similar to a function pointer. However, it provides more functionality. The C++ language has a great feature which allows operator overloading by defining a method whose name starts with the word operator. Operator open paren close paren is often referred to verbally as operator parens or the function call operator. Any class which defines the function call operator is called a function object type. An instance of a function object type is called a function object, and it can be called as if it were a regular function. A function call operator can receive parameters and return values just like a normal function can. But since it's actually a method which belongs to a class, it can also access members just like any method can access data in the class they belong to. Although a lot of C++ programmers use the term functor, it's not actually defined in the standard. So we went looking around the internet and found a lot of interesting, contradictory, and messy definitions. We both have a decent background in math, and much of what we found led us to conclude the term functor is heavily overloaded. The category theory meaning of functor was established long before C++ and has nothing to do with the C++ concept of functor. There are lots of other definitions too, and most of them pertain to math or functional programming. The term function object is the preferred term instead of functor in the C++ standard, most likely in an attempt to avoid confusion with all these other definitions. The basic idea of a function object is that it is a function which also contains information about some state. In languages like C++, this is normally implemented in terms of a class which contains members that signify the state, and the operator parens to signify the function. This is why some C++ developers refer to a functor as a function pointer on occasion. This is misleading since it glosses over the existence of the state which is a major part of what a function object is. So what is the purpose of a function object? Oftentimes it's simply a convenience. You could achieve the same results with a function pointer and access to some shared data. However, the code may not be reusable or clear to read. A normal use case is to pass a function object to a template. Since the syntax is identical for invoking a function pointer and a function object, the template can invoke the pass parameter without knowing whether it was a function pointer or a function object. One template which works this way is the std sort algorithm from the C++ standard library. 
The sort algorithm needs to know how to compare two elements, and there is a default which uses std less to compare the elements. Sometimes the default comparison does not generate the desired order. Thankfully, you can pass anything which supports the syntax of a function pointer, and thereby override the default comparison. If the comparison you need requires some additional data to do the sorting, it may be better or even necessary to pass a function object instead of a simple function pointer. This is a very basic example, which declares a function object type. My functor is a class, and it defines a function call operator. We are not showing any data members in this class, although normally you would have data members. Note the first set of parens in the operator declaration. This is part of the method name. The second set of parens contains the actual parameter declarations. This syntax does look a bit odd, but all the parentheses are required. Once we instantiate this data type to create a function object, then we can call the function object as if it were a function. The call is shown on usage A. You can also explicitly call the function operator method as shown for usage B, although there's seldom any reason to use this particular syntax. This example shows a general case where a function object can be used. When you're designing a class which only has one main method, it may be redundant to give this method a name. In the first line of code, we show the syntax for calling the log method on log object A. In the second line of code, log object B is a function object where the class has an operator parens method. Both approaches are valid and do the same thing, although the second approach does seem slightly easier to read. There are trade-offs to these two different approaches. If the log class is going to be extended to include a warning message and maybe an error message, do you want to use the first approach and add two different methods? Or should the operator parens method be enhanced to allow more parameters indicating what type of message this is? This may be a simple example, but it does show there are compelling reasons to use a function object approach. In C++11, Lambda expressions were added to the core language. Instead of defining a function object type, you can now use a Lambda expression, which will do the same thing without having to create a new class. Many people use the term Lambda, but the C++ standard uses the term Lambda expression exclusively. The syntax for a Lambda expression is very precise, and there are three main clauses delimited by square brackets, parentheses, and curly braces in that order. The result of the Lambda expression can be stored in a variable. But since the Lambda expression returns a compiler-dependent data type, this variable should usually be declared with the data type auto. If using auto doesn't work in your code, there is a templated class provided by the C++ standard called std function. This class can store lambdas as well as function pointers. This gives you the flexibility to store a lambda using a concrete data type. Just like the term functor, the idea of a lambda is heavily rooted in math. It has been around in computer science since around 1930. The idea of considering functions as entities which can be passed to other functions as data is based in the definition of the lambda calculus. These ideas have evolved over the years to produce what we now think of as functional programming. By definition, C++ is not a functional language. However, it is flexible enough to support many of the aspects of functional programming. The idea of lambda functions can be found in many different computer languages with somewhat different behavior. This is a partial list of names which are used to refer to a lambda function. The first part of the lambda expression is the capture clause. 
This specifies which outside variables will be available inside the body of the lambda. It is not necessary to capture any data. However, the square brackets are still required, even if the capture clause is empty. Next comes the parameter list, which is very similar to the parameter list for a normal function. This is optionally followed by an arrow and the return type. If no return type is specified, the return type will be deduced. The last portion is the lambda body, which is enclosed in curly braces and has the same meaning as any other function body. The capture clause can contain any number of variables to capture, and anything in scope can be captured. You can capture some variables by value and others by reference. It is important to be aware that the variables are captured when the lambda expression is defined. If a capture is by reference, you must make sure the data remains in scope for the lifetime of the lambda expression. When a variable is captured by value, it is captured as a const value. This means that the captured variables will not be modifiable inside the body of the lambda. If the data will be modified, you either must capture by reference or make the entire lambda expression mutable. The computer science definition of a closure disagrees slightly with the C++ standard. In computer science terms, a lambda which does not capture anything from the enclosing scope is not considered a closure. Since nothing was captured, there is no state. This means it consists only of code and can be considered as a function pointer. The C++ standard refers to all lambda expressions as closures. If there is nothing captured, it's simply called a special type of closure. This can be useful when calling legacy code or a C API which expects a function pointer. You can call the C function and pass a lambda expression which has no captures, and it will behave as if you passed a function pointer. The syntax available in the capture clause has been extended since lambdas were first introduced in C++11. In C++14, they added the ability to capture an expression using syntax which looks like an assignment. This adds the ability to move capture a value from the enclosing scope, which is very valuable with move-only types like STD unique pointer. It is worth mentioning again when the capture occurs, as this is critical when the capture is done by move. Even if the lambda is not invoked till later, the capture by move happens when the lambda expression is defined. Once the lambda expression has move captured from the enclosing scope, the variable cannot be used outside the lambda expression. Trying to use the data after the move capture is invalid, just like when you do any other move operation. In C++11, the only way to capture this was by capturing the this pointer by value. The capture clause was extended in C++14, so the expression which is captured could include a pointer dereference. Having this ability allows you to initialize a captured variable with the object star this. In C++17, the capture clause was enhanced again to allow a capture of the object star this without requiring it to be renamed. In both of these examples, when the pointer dereference is captured, a copy of the object is made. In C++14, the ability to specify a default value for a parameter was added to the lambda expression parameter list. You can also use a data type of auto for any of the parameters. Using auto has the effect of making the lambda expression resemble a templated function. This is called a generic lambda since it does not look exactly like a template. A new lambda body will be instantiated for each data type that is passed to the parameter declared with auto. The return type in a lambda expression is optional, as long as the compiler can deduce the return type from the return statement in the lambda body. In C++11, the compiler can only deduce this return type 
if there are zero or one return statements. In C++14, you can have multiple return statements in the body as long as they all deduce to the same data type. One advantage of specifying the return type means you are not depending on the type deduction rules. This allows implicit conversions in the return statement. In C++17, they added the ability to mark a lambda expression as const expr. But since const expr can be deduced as of C++17, you really do not need to mark it with the keyword const expr. One of the effects of the const expr keyword is to cause a compiler error if the function or lambda expression cannot be made const expr. Here is a simple example showing a lambda expression which captures x by value and simply prints out the value. The variable x must be declared before the lambda expression. When the lambda is defined, it is assigned to a variable called myLam. Note that x is then set to a new value of 7. Finally, the lambda is invoked. So the question is, what is the value of x printed in the message? Since the capture happens when the lambda expression is defined, the value becomes part of the expression. Since x is captured by value, it is copied into the expression. What is printed will be 42. It's worth noting that if x had been captured by reference, the printed value for x would be 7. In this example, the lambda expression is being passed directly to the std count if algorithm. The third parameter to count if is required and must be something which is invocable or callable. This could be a function pointer, a function object, or a lambda. Count if will invoke our lambda expression once for every element in the vector and count how many times this lambda returns true. Using a lambda expression in this way adds functionality to many of the algorithms and comparison functions which have existed in the C++ standard since C++ 98. Although lambdas were added recently and have evolved, these fundamental pieces of the standard library did not need to be modified to take advantage of lambda expressions. For more information about Copper Spice or any of the other projects we work on, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us an email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.